right, thank you. Thanks for coming, guys. Okay, so what is this talk about? First, I will motivate what is DNS spoofing and why we need a secure name resolution. Then the focus of my talk will be on DNSSEC because this is what is being deployed right now on a wide range. Um, I will introduce DNSSEC to you, but very briefly, so uh, if you know it, uh, don't sleep away. It will be over in a couple of minutes. Um, then I will talk about the deployment status. People are using DNSSEC right now, and we'll see how many people are using it. We will talk about the implications. What does it mean when people start using DNSSEC? Then we will talk about the root zone, who controls the root zone, who has the root zone key. And then we will see uh, alternative approaches to secure name resolution. Name the DNS curve approach by Dan Bernstein, who is also here at the Congress. And you, have my, uh, you might have already heard about DNS curve. He had talks about this, but um, today you will hear it from a different point of view, which may be also interesting to you. And um, then we will talk about Namecoin, which is a bit different. And in the end, uh, we will briefly uh, discuss what is Zuko's triangle. Okay, so let's start. Uh, I assume all of you have heard of this DNS thing and know what it is, but uh, let's make sure we're on the same page here. So uh, with DNS, your application can ask your operating system, your stub resolver, to resolve a name, and your stub resolver will ask a recursive name server to do the resolution because the stub resolver uh, really has only a small functionality and can only forward uh, name queries. So the recursive name server does all the work, uh, goes to all name servers, gets all the names, um, retries if anything fails, and there may be uh, multiple recursive name servers in a chain. So you can have one recursive name server in um, your local network, or your local friendly admin uh, has one. And your ISP may also, may also have a recursive name server that you're using. And then uh, the authoritative name servers will be asked, the name server that holds the data, and they deliver the DNS zone, the actual data. So DNS spoofing is when an attacker wants to spoof a DNS response to point you to another web page or to another server or whatever. And, um, a remote attacker can try to do remote UDP spoofing by, for example, um, sending you some kind of HTML link, uh, trigger a DNS resolution on your machine, and uh, then your operating system will query for a specific name, but uh, your operating system or your resolver uh, will put random data into the DNS query. Uh, and this is to, to make the attack um, less likely to succeed. So the random data will be in the transaction ID and in the source port. So it will be about 31, 32 bit of random data. And the attacker has to guess this data. And if he guesses correctly, the spoofing may succeed. If he doesn't guess it, well, then he has to try again. And this is a very expensive attack because you, you need a lot of bandwidth to actually succeed with such an attack. And then there is uh, another type of attack, a local attacker, for example, in a Wi-Fi, uh, unsecured Wi-Fi at a coffee bar. Uh, and an attacker is sniffing and he reads the contents of the, of the DNS message so we can forge a DNS message uh, or a response to your DNS query because he read um, all the data in it and he knows the random data in it. And this is a kind of easy attack and with DNS there is no real mitigation with the legacy DNS, the original DNS, so we need a secure name resolution. Okay, now what is DNSSEC? DNSSEC is a set of uh, security extensions and a couple of RFCs, and it uses uh, cryptographic mechanisms to achieve data integrity and authenticity. But note, not confidentiality, so there is no encryption of the data. And uh, also av availability was not a design goal, so it doesn't improve uh, the rel reliability of the system. And DNSSEC uh, now signs resource records, the data of the DNS, with a private key. And these signatures are then put into the, uh, into the zone. So here you have your, your name, and then there is a signature. And you, with your resolver, can verify this data uh, by looking up the DNS key, the public key. And how can you securely retrieve the public key? Well, you have to tie the DNS key, your DNS key, with the parent zone, which refers to your name server. And if you tie it all together, you only need the top key, the trust anchor. Okay, here's, here's an example. Oops, sorry. 
Here's an example uh, of a secure delegation. Um, here we have uh, a referral from the uh, net uh, top level domain to some name server. And then we have here a DS record. A DS record indicates that this is a secure delegation. The DS record contains a hash of the public key. So then the resolver can go to the next name server, IPs are here, and can retrieve the public key and can then hash the public key and can compare is this DS record, the hash, the fingerprint of the public key, does it match? And of course this DS record is also signed, otherwise this would be useless. Okay, now DNSSEC signs only resource records, not responses. So negative responses when you mistype, for example, a query a non-existing name, they have no resource records. There is only an, an error code and an X domain. So how do you uh, securely can uh, retrieve a negative answer? Well, the solution for this in DNSSEC is this. First, you sort all the names of a zone in a canonical uh, order and then you sign a proof of non-existence, the NSEC record. And it says there is a name FTP in this zone and there is a name mail, but in between there are no names. So you know okay, when I query for a specific name, uh, whatever is in between, uh, hula boo, uh, and you, uh, you get an, an X domain and you get this result and you, you get a signature for it, you can verify, okay, the, the name hula boo, which I queried does not exist. Now there's a problem with this, you disclose all your zone data. Uh, anybody can now retrieve all these NSEC records and get a copy of your zone. And not everybody wants to. Got a small audio. Okay. Okay, everything good? Sorry for the interruption. Okay, uh, now how can we avoid zone disclosure? Uh, there is uh, another mechanism, NSEC3, and uh, this works the following way. You don't disclose the domain names, you disclose hashes of the domain names. So you hash all the domain names in your zone, and then you sort by the hashes, and then you uh, give the following answer. There is a domain name with this hash, and there is a domain name with this hash, but in between there are no domain names. And whoever qu queries for this name can hash the name that we qu queried for, Hulabu, whatever, uh, will get a hash result and will see, oh, okay, this hash result should be in between these two, but it isn't. Okay, so you know uh, this name that you asked for does not exist. Uh, now there's another problem with NSEC3. Uh, you can retrieve all hash values of a zone and you can start a dictionary attack and you can do it offline. So it's uh, way faster than querying online for every do existing domain name. So you can still get a copy of the zone, but it's much harder. Okay, now what is this potential secure path of DNSSEC, secured by DNSSEC? Uh, well, we have a DNS zone, which is signed by a private key. And then we could build a stub resolver which does validating and which has a public key and everything in between is uh, secured. So you have an end-to-end uh, -end secure path. Now this is not so common. Uh, we will look into it in a minute. Uh, usually your recursive name server will do the validation, but we'll get to it. Okay, what is the deployment status of DNSSEC? How many signed zones are there? First of all, the root zone is signed for two years. Then we have 100 top-level domains, which are also signed, uh, around 100, um, out of around 300. Uh, and then you see here a selection of top-level domains and the number of signed second-level <coughs> domains. For example, uh, .nl, the Netherlands top-level domain, has more than one million signed second-level domains. It's uh, the largest uh, signed zone. And uh, if you compare this with, for example, the net top-level domain, you will see, okay, there's only 29,000. So um, it varies. These are probably the best numbers. Okay, now let's take a look at the deployment of uh, validation at stub resolvers. Here you see a list of stub resolvers. And 
the capability to validate DNS, DNS queries or responses. Basically, no operating system, no stub resolver in the operating system can validate DNS queries. However, there is an alternative. You can always run a local name server on your machine. So you can install a bind or an unbound if you don't like bind, or you can even look uh, Google for DNSSEC trigger. It's an unbound package with a nice installer. You can install it on Windows or Mac OS X. Yes, Linux too. Um, and it does all the validation. It uh, changes your resolve conf, so you get all in one package. So of course you can install uh, validation on your machine. But the stub resolvers, they are not capable of doing it right now. They are um, validating resolver libs. Uh, you can link your application against it uh, if you want to. And uh, the bind9 package in Debian 7, which is currently in testing, uh, has validation enabled by default. So expect name resolution problems. We will look into it in a minute. Uh, now you may wonder, Windows 7, uh, Windows 8, uh, they read the AD flag. What does it mean? Uh, a DNS response, when it is uh, validated by a recursive name server, uh, contains a, a flag, an AD flag. And this flag says that the server authenticated the data successfully. This is like an inverted evil bit. It's totally useless in an unsecure uh, network. So if you're in, in a local unsecure network, a public Wi-Fi, uh, don't even try to interpret this AD flag. So it's, uh, it has no real use in, in, in real life. Okay, um, what you see here is the statistics of the k-root name server operated by RIPE NCC. And um, you can see here uh, the number of queries per second. It's around 15,000. And here on the left side, you see the number of queries with the DNSSEC OK flag enabled. And this is around 12,000, so it's uh, about uh, 70%. And this flag, DNSSEC OK, it says Yes, the resolver asking uh, for this name is capable of parsing DNSSEC uh, queries or answers. It does not say that validation is enabled. It only says the software could validate, maybe. So let's take a look at how many uh, clients actually are protected by DNSSEC validation. Um, this is uh, the result of a study uh, of about um, 80,000, 90,000 clients. Uh, which ran uh, over the last six months. And you can see uh, the largest validation ratio for clients is in Sweden. It's around uh, 55%, 56 And you can see here the Czech Republic is number two. It's more than 30% of validating clients. Probably wondering about Germany, it's around 4%. And the United States is number three. It has more than 10% validating clients. Okay, so the, there are not so many clients protected by validation, but it's coming. So this uh, number was, will probably improve over the next month and years. Okay, now let's take a look at the implications of DNSSEC deployment. Uh, DNSSEC does not only add security, it adds also complexity. And it may seem obvious what we have seen here. It's, uh, some signatures, RSA signatures, uh, some key exchange. How hard should it be? Well, we have here a quote uh, of a power DNS developer, Bert Hubert. And uh, he thinks uh, DNSX is very complicated. And uh, to be fair, there is a response of one of the authors of the DNSX RFCs. And, uh, well, you see it's a point of view. Okay, now there is another problem, or, or there is a, a real reliability problem with DNSSEC, and it is validation failures look like general DNS failures. Let me explain this with an, an example of a HTTPS error, so a TLS uh, error. We go to a domain, HTTPS, and there is something wrong with the certificate. So we get a security warning. And when we are doing online banking or some security stuff, we know, okay, something is going wrong, let's stop. But if we're just browsing the web for news to read some, uh, some fun things or whatever, then we probably don't care, we just click, okay, proceed anyway. 
With DNSSEC, you can't do this. All your application, your uh, browser gets is a DNS resolution error. It looks similar to this. So you have no way to override it. You have no idea, is my internet connection down? Is the DNS server down? Did the validation not succeed? Uh, you simply can't see it. And this is because uh, the interface between the application and the stub resolver, it lacks the DNSSEC information. So there's uh, room for improvement. Now, let's take a look what happens when DNSSEC fails. And this fails too often. Two days ago, the MIL top-level domain, the military, US military top-level domain, failed because the signatures expired. Two days ago. <laughs> then, um, AP Nick which is responsible for um, assigning IP address blocks and also for the reverse lookups. Um, they had a similar problem. So the reverse lookups for several IP blocks were down after a hardware fault and then some software fa failure occurred. So in the end, the DNSSEC uh, signatures could not be validated. Only reverse lookups, so probably not that dramatic. Then you can see uh, a list of different other errors. For example, nasa.gov. They made a mistake with the DNSSEC configuration. They had to roll over the keys, but something went wrong, and the whole domain was down. And what happens when uh, validation for NASA.gov uh, fails? Well, there is one large US provider, Comcast, um, which has validation enabled for all customers, and they have millions of customers. And what happened when validation failed on Comcast resolvers? Well, users said, Hey, Comcast is blocking NASA.gov. My friend, he work, uh, works for another ISP or has another ISP connection. He can access NASA.gov, but I can't. It's Comcast's fault. And actually, it's NASA.gov's fault because they made the error on the DNS zone. So what Comcast is doing now, uh, if they find out, okay, there is some validation error, they try to contact the admin of the DNS zone, and um, they also use negative trust anchor. So this means they simply uh, don't do validation on this specific zone. They turn it off for one specific zone. So it's not really uh, the best way, but, excuse me? DNS ANSEC. DNS ANSEC, yeah. But uh, it's uh, like a temporary measure while not everybody is doing validation. So you don't want to be the ISP which has the uh, DNS failures while the others don't have it. Okay, and if, if you want to read more DNSSEC failures, here is also a link, so uh, there's plenty to read. Okay, now let's take a look at uh, system time versus DNSSEC. The keys in DNSSEC, they do not expire, but the signatures, they expire, they have absolute validity periods. This is new. In legacy DNS, there were only those relative TTL values for caching. But in DNSSEC, you need a correct system time, more or less. If it varies by a couple of minutes, maybe a couple of hours shouldn't be too worse. But if you boot your system and your uh, system time is reset to factory defaults, then your DNSSEC validation will fail. And now if you try to sync your system time with SNTP, for example, well, how do, how do you want to resolve pool.ntp.org? So we have a little bootstrapping uh, problem here. And it doesn't help to not sign this domain because the root uh, zone is signed and the top level domain is signed, so in the end, the DNSSEC validation will fail. So, uh, what could you do? Maybe the NTP guys could set up an Anycast cloud, uh, which could be at least used as a fallback. Uh, or maybe DNSSEC validation could be turned off while the system finds out the system time is uh, definitely desync or whatever. So there's, again, room for improvement. Okay, now let's take a look at amplification attacks. You may have heard of it. Um, when you deploy DNSSEC, the CPU load will increase on the resolvers because they do all the validation stuff, but not so much on the servers because uh, DNSSEC supports offline signing, so you can do it uh, on another machine. You can then copy the signed zone to the actual authent uh, authoritative server, and you can also do incremental signing, so you don't need to sign everything 
every time new whenever you have a dynamic update in your zone, for example. So you can only resign parts of the zone. Um, however, the network load increases significantly on the servers. This is because all these signatures, RSA signatures, take a lot of space. So now we have a problem. Legacy DNS already um, had a problem with denial, uh, distributed denial of service attacks. The public DNS infrastructure is abused for amplification attacks. So, um, uh, DDoS attackers use the public DNS infrastructure to amplify their traffic. And uh, this becomes even more effective with DNSSEC because the responses uh, are even larger. And the cause for it is not really DNS, it's IP spoofing, which can be done uh, within botnets. So the solution is also not really DNS, it would be to filter all these spoofed traffic near the source. However, there are currently way too many networks which um, allow to do IP spoofing, and this won't change in the near future. So you have to do some DNS-specific countermeasure because you can't just do nothing. And there is a, a countermeasure for this, and this is DNS rate limiting. However, there is a trade-off. When you rate limit, uh, it's a question of effective filtering versus collateral damage by doing too much filtering. So the naive approach would be to just set up an IP tables rule, uh, do some rate limiting, but this is usually bad. Uh, this will be either too specific for, for one specific attack, so then Attica will just change one parameter and uh, your filter will be worthless, or it will be too easy to abuse, for example, by locking out your victim, by sending spoofed um, queries uh, to make the rate limiting, uh, to activate the rate limiting and to filter legitimate traffic from a victim. Uh, there is a better approach, it's called DNS response rate limiting. And the assumption of DNS response rate limiting is a resolver has a cache, so the re legitimate resolver won't ask 10 times a second the same query, it will cache it. And also, when one packet is dropped, the resolver will retry a couple of times, let's say three times, and then it will give up. So what do you do with DNS response rate limiting? First of all, you track the state for identical responses per IP address block, and when you see, okay, there is an identical response and it is now 10 times or a second or so, or five times a second, then you turn on filtering. But you slip truncated responses every so and so many packets. Uh, the default is every two packets slip a truncated packet. Now, what does this mean? It means you send a response, but not the full response, not the amplified response, only a truncated one, so there is no amplification. And this truncated response has a chance to receive the legitimate uh, query store. So whenever the filtering uh, is activated, the victim of the rate uh, of the amplification attack still has a chance to send a query and get a truncated response. Not every time, but well, retry, and then it will get after a second or third try a truncated response. And when it gets a truncated response, it will do a TCP retry. And with TCP retry, you have uh, no problems with amplification attacks. So uh, DNS response rate limiting may do some damage, but it's very limited. Okay, and there's uh, one important note. Uh, rate limiting protects the amplification target. Uh, it does not protect the amplifier. It does not protect your authoritative name server. So if you have a problem with uh, distributed denial of service attacks, which use up all your bandwidth on your name server, well, use over-provisioning, use any, code, uh, any cast, uh, buy more bandwidth, uh, that's the solution. If you do rate limiting, it uh, won't really help you, it uh, may do more harm. Okay, and also another note, uh, this is not applicable for recursive servers. So if you have a, a recursive server which is doing a recursive name resolution, uh, use IP-based access control. Um, don't install rate limiting. Okay, now let's take a look at uh, another issue. Uh, let's take a look at ISP wildcard redirects. Um, there are some ISPs which are doing redirects when you query for a non-existing name. So you query for uh, www.example.net and this name doesn't exist uh, and you should get an, an X domain, a name resolution error. 
Instead, uh, the provider sends you an, an A record and points you to a web server, and this web server shows, uh, shows advertisements, uh, like here in the top right. So what happens when uh, we deploy DNSSEC? Well, a v validating ISP can still add the redirect after validation, but uh, it won't have correct signatures. So when you also validate, you will get a serve fail. This is a response uh, after validation has failed. So instead of an X domain, which would be the correct response, you will get a serve fail. However, this looks identical in, uh, in web browsers. So you see here a comparison. Uh, one is an serve fail, one is an X domain, and uh, they look the same in a web browser. So uh, to the user, everything will be fine. And of course, you don't need to use the ISP forwarder. You can just run your own resolver and don't need uh, to rely on your ISP forwarder, which is lying to you. Okay, let's take a look at another uh, redirect. And what happens if this is done by the top level domain operator? For example, Verisign was doing this a uh, couple of years ago for the uh, COM top level domain. This would still work. You can still do wildcards in DNSSEC, but it's get, it gets very ugly. So if you have a DNSSEC implementation and everything works correctly, try wildcards, you may discover new bugs. Uh, and here are two examples for it. Okay. Now what happens with another type of redirects uh, with the purpose of censorship? Uh, now, when we have a government-mandated ISP redirection, for example, in Germany you um, have heard the term Censursula, which was such an attempt to do DNS redirection for uh, censorship or blocking. Uh, a validating ISP, again, can still add a redirect after validation, and again, a validating client will get a serve fail, but now a serve fail instead of an A record. So the client won't be redirected to a notice where it says you have been redirected, you're doing something illegal, stop doing it. Uh, instead, it will be a general name resolution error. So you won't notice that you have been censored. Okay, and again, if you're affected by this, do not use the ISP forwarders. In general, it is more reliable to not use any forwarders with DNSSEC. Um, there are situations when you rely on a forwarder and this forwarder is not validating, where you keep getting the same response, a bogus response, because the forwarder does not know that it's a, a bogus response, it's not validating, and you can't really recover from that. So, uh, in doubt, don't use any forwarders. Okay, um, then there is another um, government censorship method, and it's called DNS injection. And there is a paper in which it is described by an uh, anonymous uh, research group, uh, very interesting, I highly recommend it, it's under number 17. And um, DNS injection uses deep packet inspection to then spoof DNS responses. However, um, the current method that is being used, it is being used in mainland China, is very coarse-grained, so for example, when you query for that name, the filter might apply, so you may get a spoof DNS response. And also it doesn't care about source addresses and uh, de destination IP addresses. So you query for a blocked domain name, um, there is some deep packet inspection running on a router, and you get a, a spoof DNS response. Now you may ask yourself, I don't live in China, why should I care? Uh, but this doesn't only uh, does not only affect Chinese ASs. Uh, it also affects uh, networks from other countries um, and with any cast which is being used uh, in the root and in the uh, top level domains, your packets may take strange routes. So you actually, actually you might be routed through a Chinese AS. It's not very likely, but it can happen. And this study uh, in this paper suggests that open resolvers from over 100 countries have been affected by this DNS injection, which only takes place in China, but affects through any cast and through routing issues, also other countries. Um, the original packets do not seem to be suppressed. So you get a spoof response, and you get the actual response currently. So DNSSEC validation would uh, protect you from this type of attack. <laughs> You would get the spoof response, doesn't validate, okay, throw it away. Get the next response, okay, this one validates, correct. 
Um, however, when they decide to turn on suppression, so when they decide, okay, send only the spoofed response and filter the correct response, um, it will depend whether uh, DNSSEC will really help. If you are within an AS which uses this censorship method, then, well, you have no other routes, no transit paths which aren't censored, so we have lost. But if you're around China, in one of these countries that may route through China, uh, you will have a chance to throw away the spoof response and to ask another name server from the set of name servers. Because there is a redundant set of name servers for the root zone, redundant set of name servers for the top level domains. So uh, when you get a censored response, uh, you can try another one and uh, maybe you're lucky. So uh, DNSSEC may reduce the harm that is done by this censorship method. Okay, uh, let's compare X509, um, the TLS SSL certificate structure with DNSSEC. Um, with X509, uh, there are more than 600 organizations that are allowed to uh, create certificates that are trusted by your web uh, browsers. And more than 1,500 uh, root CA uh, certificates are actually trusted by your web browsers. And the problem with X509 is, uh, you can't really delegate only a part of a trust. So you can't say, okay, let's uh, uh, let's say this CA is only allowed to issue certificates for this and this domain. This is not possible. If you have a CA, uh, it can issue certificates for every domain. Uh, now, what could change with DNSSEC? With DNSSEC, there is a, um, an RFC. It's called Dane TLSA, uh, and you can put TLS certificates into the DNS. With DNSSEC, trust is limited to one domain, so the COM top-level domain can't mess up with the org top-level domain. Uh, however, the DNS root can mess with anyone. So the pro is the trust in root is now limited to one organization instead of 600 uh, uh, CA organizations with X509. The con is this organization gets very powerful, and it's the ICANN. So um, I don't know whether this is a good idea, uh, at least uh, it's an alternative to X509. Okay, let's take a look at the trust anchor. It's a, a public root key that you're installing. Um, and let's take a look at who can actually forge um, answers uh, f which should come from your second level domain. The root zone operator can forge answers because the root zone uh, is asked with a full name. So, for example, www.example.net, this query goes to the root zone, and the root zone operator could mess with it, could uh, spoof a response. Uh, the registries or the top-level domain operators then can do the same, and your registrar, registrar where you registered your second-level domain could also mess with this, because you need to um, submit your DS record, the hash of your public key, to the registrar, and the registrar could simply change it. Um, now, you can change the trust anchor configuration in your resolvers. You can put uh, specific domains in the configuration, and you can also uh, put keys for alternative DNS routes. So alternative DNS routes are still possible with DNSSEC. Of course, you have to configure the trust anchor manually. Okay, uh, trust anchors can be changed um, automatically uh, if they are updated. However, you need to uh, install the initial uh, trust anchor uh, by hand. So the initial key must be installed by hand, and then you can do automatic rollovers. Okay, now who controls the root zone and who has the key? Uh, the top-level domain operators, when they have a change which needs to be submitted to the root zone, for example, name server address has changed or uh, contact has changed, they submit it to the ICANN. The ICANN is performing the IANA function, and the ICANN sends it to the NTIA, which is a department of the U.S. government. And the U.S. government must approve every change to the root zone. And if the U.S. government approves this change, it sends it to VeriSign, which is the operator of the A root server, and VeriSign creates the actual root zone, the actual assigned data. And now ICANN... <coughs> uh, is in possession of the root key signing key. This is the top level key. This is uh, the most important key. And it has created this key. 
and it uses this key to sign the zone signing key. This is a level right under the KSK, under the key signing key. So VeriSign uses a zone signing key, the ZSK, to sign the actual uh, root zone data. And the reason for this, uh, for having two keys, and uh, this is uh, common in DNS, like you have this also with your second level domain, you have a KSK which is changed, uh, not, uh, which is changed rarely, and you have a ZSK which you can change often uh, to uh, improve security. Okay, so we have the ICANN with the KSK and we have the VeriSign with the ZSK. Okay, now where are the, uh, where has the KSK been created and where is it stored? There are two ICANN facilities in commercial uh, data centers. These are not actually ICANN facilities, these are data centers, but ICANN has rented some room in it. There is one facility uh, in US West and one in US East, both US. And, um, ICANN uh, creates the KSK, uh, ICANN signs the ZSK, which is brought by VeriSign, and also trusted community representatives are in involved in this process. Trusted community representatives um, chosen by the ICANN, which um, uh, are there to uh, oversee the process, to um, um, make sure everything is working correctly, and to say, yes, I've, uh, I've seen this, and they created the key uh, in the right way. And here are some pictures of the um, KSK key ceremony. There are also videos online, so you can uh, check these references here and watch the videos. You see there is a room with people, uh, um, with trusted community representatives. There are um, armed guards, so uh, don't try to get into the data center, you will probably get shot. Um, and they are using hardware security modules to create the key and to do the signing operation. Hardware security modules uh, store the key inside and um, they are uh, thought to be um, more secure than uh, an actual machine. So if you try to tamper with this device, it will delete the key. That's what the manufacturer says. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, there was a comment that deletes sometimes the key even with, when there is no tampering. Uh, and uh, yes, when you have some uh, voltage uh, issues, uh, you can also trigger this, uh, this deletion process. Okay, so where are the keys then stored? The HSMs are inside this, uh, the safes, these safes. And, uh, well, the trusted community representatives uh, have also access to these safes when there is a key ceremony. We will discuss this now. Okay, so we have four HSMs with four copies of the private root KSK key. Okay, how to access uh, or to activate the private key inside the HSM? You need smart cards. There is a set of seven smart cards west and se a set of seven smart cards east, and you need three out of seven smart cards to activate the HSM and to do some signing. Okay, where are these smart cards? The, sp the smart cards are in a safe and uh, in, s in boxes for which you need a physical key. So there are seven physical keys for West, seven physical keys for East. And these physical keys are distributed to the trusted community representatives. So there are also backup keys. They are stored on smart cards. So when the HSMs have uh, hardware faults and you can't use the HSMs anymore, there are also four smart cards, two East, two West, uh, which have the private key stored in an encrypted form. And to decrypt the private key, you need also another set of smart cards. This is shown here. Seven smart cards, and you need five out of seven. And these smart cards are distributed to community representatives. So the commu trusted community representatives don't have direct access to the key. They have only access to the key when they are invited by ICANN. And what you can see here is, in the gray area, what is stored in the ICANN safes, in the uh, data centers. The HSMs are there, the backup cards are there, the smart cards are there. What is distributed to the trusted community representatives are the physical keys and the smart card to decrypt uh, the backup uh, smart cards. Okay. Uh, so here are some details for you to read later on. Uh, with respect to time, we will skip this and uh, go to the next um, topic, and this is DNS curve. DNS curve is an alternative concept to secure DNS. 
It uses the most obvious changes. It uses elliptic curves instead of RSA, and it is far less complex. Uh, it does not introduce any new DNS resource records. There are no DS records, no DNS key records, no signature uh, records. And the keys are also uh, associated to name servers, not to the zones. This is the difference. And DNS curve secures the link between one authoritative server and one resolver, a direct link. And unlike DNSSEC, there is no end-to-end -end security. So you have to make a connection from your secure resolver to the authoritative name server. You can't use multi-hop forwarding. And DNS curve also uses online cryptography instead of pre-generated signatures. Okay, this is the secure path of DNS curve. Uh, again, link between one recursive name server and the authoritative name server. There are no ISP forwarders uh, in between. You can't use them for forwarding. And also the keys, the private keys, are on the name servers. And each name server can have a different key. But you can also use the same key on all of them. Okay. Um, DNS curve messages use also UDP port 40, uh, 53, um, but a new custom message format, which is not compatible with uh, legacy DNS. Um, it supports also TXT tunneling. It tunnels all data in TXT resource records. This is to uh, go through uh, strict firewalls, which are looking into DNS packets and uh, verify whether this is really a, a DNS packet. Um, and uh, DNS curve works the following way. It puts the legacy DNS message, the unchanged DNS message, into a crypto box. And this crypto box uh, is encrypted, it is, it is signed, and uh, this crypto box is now part of a packet, and this packet contains a nonce, a random number used once, and this packet is unique. So what does this mean? This packet is unique, so uh, you have no validity periods. It is read once, and then it is forgotten. Replay attacks are not possible this way, when the nonce is really unique. Uh, there is no expiration of signatures, and the system time doesn't need to be correct. So when NTP has some issues, or you have some issues with NTP, whatever, um, DNS curve will still work and verify everything correctly. And also, NX domains is secure without NSEC or other data, because you encrypt or you sign the whole packet, um, so NX domains doesn't need any additional data for um, extra signatures. So a bonus of DNS curve is um, that the crypto boxes are encrypted, so you can't read them um, by eavesdropping. However, this is only a small privacy gain because you can still see the IP addresses of the name server that you're talking to. You can still see the server name in a TLS handshake, so it's nice, but it's not uh, really that huge improvement. Okay. Uh, what kind of cryptography is used by DNS curve? It uses a networking and cryptography lib, pronounced SALT, and it uses elliptic curves for the Diffie-Hellman key exchange, 255-bit uh, public keys. Um, this is, uh, this, the security level can be compared with RSA 3000-bit, and in general, it should be faster than RSA. There are some disputes about uh, performance, but in general, ECC is faster because it uses shorter signatures. Um, then it uses also a shared key. It uses this elliptic curve uh, uh, key exchange to generate a shared key between resolver and name server. And this shared key is then used to um, do the actual um, signing and encryption operations and uh, it can be also cached and reused later. So if one resolver is communicating with the same server, it can reuse one shared key. Okay, um, how do you get the, the keys? Um, the client transmits its public key in the query, so the server gets it, and the server encodes the public key as server name in the parent zone. This is shown here. You have here a delegation for example.net and delegates to some server. And here in the server name, we have the public key of the DNS curve capable server. And this is put in the parent zone, in the top level domain, for example. So you don't need extra resource records for the key. And uh, it will be secure if the parent also uses DNS curve. So you need only, again, uh, for the root zone, uh, like a trust anchor. Okay, now let's take a look. Could we deploy DNS curve in the root zone? This is a map of 
uh, root name servers, all any cast instances uh, in the world, more than 300. Do we really want to put the private key on all these servers? Well, think of the um, DNS injection attacks. You certainly don't want to put the private key in every country. Um, and this is the reason why DNS curve cannot be deployed on the root zone. Uh, ICANN does not want uh, to distribute the key everywhere. Uh, the um, US government also doesn't want this. So DNS curve will never be used in the ICANN root zone. Okay, the private key must be online on the name server. It's not feasible for root, also not feasible for major top level domains, which are also using any cast, which are also distributing the name servers in uh, many countries. And what does it mean when um, online cryptography is being used, online signing? Um, well, you could try to do a CPU exhaustion attack on the authoritative name server. The question is, uh, does this really have an impact, or is uh, ECC this fast that it doesn't really matter? Um, well, it's unsure, I can't answer this. Maybe um, Dan has uh, some data on this. Um, the response sizes of the uh, name servers increase slightly. You need to, uh, to send the crypto boxes, but there, it's only a minor amplification factor, so it's comparable to legacy DNS. So it doesn't make amplification attacks worse like DNSSEC does, but it also doesn't solve them. So amplification attacks are still possible but not with, with uh, such a huge amplification factor. Okay, uh, we have no multi-hop caching. So what will this mean for the load on the top level domain name servers when we have less caching? Uh, unknown, I have no data found on this. And what's interesting, DNS curve happily carries also DNS sec uh, signed data. So you can use both uh, transport DNS sec signatures within DNS curve. But unfortunately, you can't use DNSSEC in the root zone and in the top-level domain zone to securely retrieve the public key of DNS curve. And this is because DNSSEC does not sign everything in a delegation. Uh, the server name is not signed, only the DS record, only the fingerprint. So it's a bummer, but no. You have to implement a server uh, which uh, uses both DNSSEC and DNS curve and which then uh, changes from DNS to DNS curve or whatever. Uh, it's not really useful. Um, so an open issue is how to securely retrieve the DNS curve public key. This is not solved yet. Okay, um, we are short on time, so uh, let's move on to Namecoin. A Namecoin is a peer-to-peer -peer based naming system, and it's uh, very different than what we have seen with DNS and DNS curve. Uh, Namecoin is based on Bitcoin. It's actually a fork. And it uses a namespace which is controlled by a peer-to-peer -peer majority and not a centralized instance, like, for example, the root zone. Okay, so we have uh, miners uh, who generate name coins, like in Bitcoin. Uh, users can send name coins to each other, like in Bitcoin. And all transactions are publicly shared by all users. And uh, now Namecoin introduces new transaction to store and update name data. So you can store arbitrary name value data, uh, 255 bytes for the name plus uh, 1,023 uh, bytes for the value. And the primary use case is to put into these fields DNS-like data. So you could put also your GPG signature in there. It's also possible. And each of these transactions costs a small fee, like in Bitcoin. Um, you need to refresh the names. They expire if you don't refresh it, and this will also cost again a fee. Okay, how can you resolve uh, name coin names? All domain names uh, are um, organized under a virtual .bit top-level domain. This top-level domain doesn't exist. It's not in the icon root. And it's also not applied for in the new GTLD problem, so it won't be in the icon root for the next um, couple of years. Now, all users in the Namecoin P2P network share a copy of all names of the whole Namecoin database. And Namecoin, like Bitcoin does, ensures the integrity of this. So you can do, when you participate in the name peer to peer systems, local secure name lookups. Now the question is, how can outsiders resolve .bit names? For example, your mobile device. You can't really go with your mobile device uh, in a peer to peer network and stay online all the time. So there are approaches for this, uh, DNS gateways to the Namecoin uh, namespace. And there are two methods to do this, and one is bad and the other is worse. <laughs> Uh, 
the first method is you configure a domain search suffix in your operating system to point to a name coin DNS gateway. And whenever you type in a .bit name, uh, your resolver will first go to DNS. It will find out, okay, .bit doesn't exist. You get an NX domain. And then your operating system will append the suffix. And this suffix will point to a name coin DNS server. And uh, the resolver will now retry to resolve this name. And this is bad because some guy on the internet running this name coin DNS gateway will get all your NX domain queries. And the other method is to use a, directly a name coin DNS gateway as a resolver. And this is bad because this guy on the internet will get all your DNS queries. Don't do this. There is also no secure way for outsiders to resolve .bit names. So there is uh, no way to get DNS sex signed data or another uh, kind of signature. So um, this outsider resolution is not secure. It's only secure if you participate in the Namecoin B2B system. And it's also incompatible with DNS sec because the root says there is no dot bit and the root says it's secure, securely. Okay. Um, Last slide, let's take a look at Zuko's triangle. What is Zuko's triangle? Think of what are desirable properties of a naming system. You want a naming system to be secure. You want a naming system to be decentralized. You want a naming system to use new and meaningful um, names. So not random names generated by some uh, secure uh, random number generator. And now the claim of Zuko's triangle, of, of Zuko, uh, it's a peer-to-peer -peer hacker. Uh, the claim is any naming system can fulfill at most two of them, of these properties. And an example for this is DNSSEC. With DNSSEC, you get a secure naming system with human meaningful names. You can choose your name, whatever you want. Uh, yes, if a name is taken, then you can't choose it, but well, choose another one. But it's not decentralized because it's, a, it's hierarchical. And um, the root is very powerful, so the root can mess with anyone. So it's not uh, decentralized in the way that Zuko meant it. Now let's take a look at Namecoin. Namecoin is a decentralized network. Uh, it doesn't use a hierarchical structure. Uh, it uses human meaningful names, if the namespace is not spammed. And it's also secure if you participate in the peer-to-peer -peer system. So it actually achieves all the three properties. However, think of what about scalability and what about efficiency. You need to participate in the peer-to-peer -peer system and you need to copy the whole data of the namespace of Namecoin. And this namespace might get large. So there are some scalability and efficiency issues. Uh, and that it solves all three properties doesn't mean that it's really better than DNSSEC or DNS curve. Okay, so let's conclude this talk. We have... Uh, seen a lot about DNSSEC, we have seen alternative uh, name resolution approaches uh, and decide for yourself uh, what is the status of secure name resolution, is it this one or is it this one? Uh, thanks for listening. Thanks, Matthews. It's an excellent presentation. So I'm sure we have a lot of questions. I know we have a few from the really? internet already. So if you have Still a question, questions. <laughs> please go over to uh, the microphone over here or the microphone over here. And while we're waiting, let's get a question from the internet. Thank you very much. Um, a user on the internet commented and asked for your feedback on the thing that since about three to four months ago, .com, .net, and .org have broken proofs of non-existence through mm -hmm. NSEC and NSEC free records, mm -hmm. even though they are present in the answer. Can you care to comment on that matter? Um, I don't really know about this. Well, DNSSEC failures occur. Um, administrators make errors, and DNSSEC has a lot of um, opportunities to make an error. So um, what we need to do is uh, the DNSSEC tools, the administration tools need to mature and the admins need to get better. Um, well, uh, unfortunately, uh, DNSSEC does not improve the reliability. Uh, it's getting worse. Thank you. Question from the room? Okay. Um, what question you said that it is not possible to connect the bit namespace with other namespaces in a secure way. Am I right about this? Um, 
No, uh, I didn't mean this. Um, right now, the way it is currently implemented, it is not securely implemented. You could design a secure way. And yeah, I'm sure people are working on this. Do you mean this? Yeah, because I think the secure way is to use your own local DNS server mm -hmm. and to use a specific forwarder to the bit namespace mm -hmm. and let that point to the bit yes. name the, server. That would yes. be secure or not? Uh, yes, you can implement it in a secure way. However, it has to be done. Yeah, okay. okay. So that's the configuration issue then, um, more or less. Well, if, uh, how much effort uh, do we want to put it in it? Uh, it's a question of anybody, uh, somebody has to write it first. Well, I, th I don't think there's any code needed because you can do that with a standard DNS server. Uh, yes, if you run a name coin node yourself. No, if you run something like unbound or a uh, bind, and define a forward stop zone that points to oh, okay. a name coin enabled name server. Yes, but the name coin resolution is not secure then. Okay. Okay, so still some room for improvement there, but yeah. right, it's, it's, it can be done, yes. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Thanks for your question. Uh, another question from the internet? Okay, um, there was a comment, uh, X509 has an extension to constrain the uh, namespace that is delegated to a um, specific CA. Um, yes, I've heard about this, however, it is not widely implemented to my uh, knowledge. Well, thank you. The NSS crypto library used by Firefox and other Mozilla yeah. software does use it. Oh, okay. So, uh, mm -hmm. And it's deployed in the real world? Yes. Okay, great. So Mozilla already has a Greek domain. Uh, sorry. Mozilla, the Mozilla root CA list has run recently added Greek CA, which is only, I believe, um, uh, constrained to the .gr domain. It might also be okay for .org, but I forgot that detail. Okay, that's good. Um, let's hope other browser vendors will also jump on the train. Thanks. We have another question in the room. No. Hi. Um, thank you for the good overview of the, the name server solution systems out there. Um, I've been working with DNSSEC for about 10 years now, and I have a few comments about DNSSEC and NSEC 3 and other stuff. Mm -hmm. um, using NSEC is, is okay because if you believe that you can put secret data in your DNS infrastructure, you're doing it wrong. I agree. So the main feature of N63 is the opt-out function where you can actually, if you have a huge domain, such as for a TLD, you, have not to, you can sign not all your data, but just some of it that is considered secure. Okay. Um, yes, it's a performance optimization. Thanks yeah. for this. Uh, but performance optimization is good on that scale, but it can uh, use a lot more CPU on the authoritative name service because uh, the authoritative yes. name service has to do a lot of work to produce uh, annex domain answers. Yes. Um, for the next two years, we will also have uh, 1,400 new GTLDs added to the root zone. Mm -hmm. Yes, we and will. <laughs> all of those will use the NSSEC. Uh, is this enforced by policy? Yes. Okay, so we will have a lot of DNSSEC failures in the next two years. Yes. <laughs> but. Um, Using NSSEC is still a good thing, but we have need better tools for that. Yes, of course, that's true. Uh, and better monitoring on that TLD level, at least. Um, um, I had another comment, but maybe you can. We can I do it offline. We can okay. talk afterwards. Can you, can you uh, say a name? Pa Patrick Pastrum. Okay. I work with the Open NSSEC project. Oh, cool. So we have time for one more quick question. Is there any question from the internet? No questions from the internet. Questions in the room? All right. Thank you very much, Mattress. Thank you.